。朋友们哈，咱们今天这个视频会跟往期的内容有那么一点点不一样，因为小林要去采访一位商界大佬。这哥们儿啊，还真挺厉害的。三十岁的时候，不光当上了副教授，还已经两次把公司卖给谷歌，早早实现了财富自由。而且啊，他还特别受比尔盖茨的赏识，就比尔盖茨亲自请他去微软。可是小哥呢，偏不去，非要自己创业。结果还真折腾出来一个现在全球五亿用户的产品。这期视频不会像之前节奏那么快，但我是真心希望大家可以静下心来听一听。Oh, I heard you've talked to like Bill Gates for forty-five minutes. Oh, was that true? Yeah, more than that. 今天的主角呢是多邻国的创始人兼 CEO 路易斯·冯安。多邻国是个语言学习的 app， 是全世界下载量最高的教育类软件，目前有超过五亿用户。它是二零二一年在纳斯达克挂牌上市的，目前市值六十五亿美元。咱今天就来一起看看哈，这个路易斯他作为一个创业者，是怎么样从无到有，从小到大一步一步做起来的，也听听他对像个人成长啊、职场啊的一些思考。我先给大家简单介绍一下路易斯的背景哈，他是一九七九年哈出生在危地马拉，就是在墨西哥南边的一个国家。这哥们哈有一点那种天才型选手的意思，他是在卡耐基梅隆读的计算机的博士。咱知道啊，卡耐基梅隆的 CS 在全美一直都排在前三，他不光在这儿读了博士啊，之后还留校当了教授。两千年，他刚读博士的时候，哈，就做了一个项目，叫做 Captcha。这个好多人一听就是特别烦，因为它是那种人类验证工具，就一堆歪七扭八的字母，让你去输入识别。但后来哈，他特别聪明，就通过这个项目帮助《纽约时报》数字化了他们一百多年的资料，然后顺便拿了《纽约时报》六百万美元。What? 其实这个 Captcha 的项目哈，最开始是因为要给雅虎去解决当时他们遇到的一个问题。但这路易斯呢，当时也没什么社会经验，就连个公司都没成立，甚至把这个成果免费给了雅虎。You sold it to Yahoo? No, I gave it to them for free. I didn't offer、oh, to get the charge. If you do it again right now, would you charge them? Yes. Oh、uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yes, yes. 后来二零零五年的时候哈，他又做了一个图片识别的游戏。哎，哥们这回学聪明了，成立了公司，最后卖给了谷歌，结果又顺便赚了一笔巨额外快。I didn't even have employees or anything. That was in 2004. I sold that to Google. Yes. Oh my god. How、yes. how old were you then? Like 2004. I must have been 25. 25. 到零七年的时候，哈，他又在原来那个 Captcha 的基础上改进，做了一个 Recaptcha。我相信这个名字，哈，在海外生活的朋友肯定特别熟悉，就是应用特别广泛的那个人机验证，每天在世界的各个角落会被用上上亿次。没想到吧？这玩意儿就是鲁易斯发明的。最后呢，这个 Recaptcha 又被他卖给了谷歌。具体多少钱，暂时没查到哈，但肯定是很多钱。用他的话说 ，Because I had sold the company to Google, I had more money than I ever needed. <音乐> I was like curious when you sold a company to Google. Did you sign anything? For example, you have to stay at Google for several years, yes, and then you get the vested shares,、exactly、things like、right. that. That's exactly right.、Um, so I signed something that said I had to stay for two years. Uh huh.、Um, and every month that I stayed, I got m- yeah <laughs> more more part of the、yeah. acquisition. I ended up staying not exactly for two years, almost two years, for about a year and ten months. 你看看啊，这时候的路易斯不到三十岁，在卡耐基梅隆当副教授，同时呢，之前那三次小项目让他早就财务自由了。怎么样？我看说他天才型选手是不是还挺有道理的？然后路易斯在他进了谷歌之后呢，他还是不老实，内心总是非常的萌动，他的脑子里哈、啊、就产生了一个新的想法。就是做教育。Excited about this is something that we've been sort of semi quietly working on for the last year and a half or so. It hasn't been yet been launched. It's called Duolingo. Since it hasn't been launched, so you were doing computer science. Then how did you decide to go into the field of education? Then I'm not from the United States.、Sure. I am from Guatemala. It's a very it's a small and very poor country. In poor countries,、uh-huh. and I assume this happens in China too. People that have a lot of money can buy themselves a really good education and therefore continue being very rich. Whereas people who don't have very much money don't get a very good education, and this is what happens in Guatemala. So I wanted to do something that would give equal access to everyone, and this is why、uh, we started Duolingo. 好，路易斯又有了一个新的创业项目，那就要面临着一个创业初期最头疼的两件事儿，就是团队和融资。但谁知道你说这俩事儿在他那儿根本就不叫事儿。How did you construct initial team? Like, do you have a team at the beginning? Yeah, it was a it was a very small team. The entirety of the team was students of mine at Carnegie Mellon. So I was a professor at Carnegie Mellon,、uh-huh. and I picked my best students, and I、uh-huh. asked them if they wanted to be、uh-huh. part of the team, and they said yes. That's like a perk being a professor. That was yeah. So it, it, and most of them are still working、uh, at Duolingo. Oh,、uh, nice! Yes, wow, this is twelve years、know. later. Most of them、wow. are still there. Wow, that's nice. Do you have any funding at the beginning? Um, at the very beginning, we didn't. We were just working at Carnegie Mellon.、Um, Did you pay them, or、like? no? Everybody was doing it kind of for free. But、oh. I would say a few months in, maybe six months in,、uh, we got funding from a venture capital firm.、Uh, we got three million dollars,、oh, uh, which、nice. at the time felt like a lot of money. 
And that's when we started paying people. So when you talk to the VC, like the app was free. Yes. So how, what's your business model? How did we you? We had none. We had no you business. Don't have... No. <laughs> At the beginning, we just went and we told the VCs, look, I just sold the company to Google. They made a lot of money. <laughs> okay. I have this thing. It's uh -huh. free. I don't know how it's going to make money, but it... trust me. <laughs> oh and, my God. Uh, it works. It worked. When you had the idea of Duolingo, mm -hmm. what kind of mar research did you do? Very little. Very little. Very little. Instead of doing research, we decided to start making it. I am a native Spanish speaker, so oh I made gosh. the first Spanish course. Oh. And my co-founder, Severin, is a native German speaker. Okay. And he made the first German course. What we told each other is, I will make the Spanish course and he has to learn Spanish. Uh -huh. And he made the German course and I had to learn German. And oh, so we started learning each other's language through through the, 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 the first the, the, oh. yes the first version of Duolingo, oh, and we ran into this problem that um, we would come into the office every day at uh -huh. like 9 a.m. and I would say, "Hey, did you do your your Spanish lesson?" And he would say, <laughs> "No, nah, it was so boring." Oh, really? And I, this, the same thing was happening to me. I, I uh -huh. couldn't. It was too boring. This is when we learned that the hardest thing about learning a language by yourself is staying motivated because we couldn't even do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So that's why. We very quickly decided to turn Duolingo into something that feels a lot like a game ah, um, so that I we see. ourselves could do it. Gotcha. And, and that worked really well. So by the time we launched, uh -huh. Duolingo was, uh, it felt a lot like a game, so it was fun. It was fun and free. 这是因为路易斯发现了哈，学语言最大的障碍其实是无聊，所以呢，他从一开始就奠定了多林国的风格，就是要特别的轻松有趣。整个 UI 设计就是个游戏，特别 Q。你明明在那学东西吧，但就真感觉跟打游戏过关似的。而且它每一关或者说每一节课啊，也就那么三五分钟，你就完全不会有“学习”这两个字给你带来那种压力。反正这是我用下来特别大的一个感受。我觉得这点吧，也是多邻国为什么能如此之快的普及的一个非常重要的原因。So、how do you make sure it's like the a systematic enough for you to learn a language because it's all games? We do two things. We hire people um, with PhDs in second language acquisition. We've spent a lot of effort on actually structuring the courses so that they teach the easy grammar first, mm -hmm. then the harder grammar, etc. And so we, we, that's one thing we do. The other thing we do is we look at the data as people are learning. And if we find that too many people are, are making too many Stop. mistakes oh, or something, okay. Okay. We, we go and make changes. The way it works is in English speaking countries, people want to learn a lot of languages. Mm -hmm. In non-English speaking countries, people want to learn English. So But I think for those two types, the the goal might be different. It is like yeah, for people who are learning English, they might want to get a better career or education. But for those who are native English speaker, maybe just for fun It's or hobby. for yes. travel, yeah. So yes. how did you like accommodate to fit those needs? It's. It's very interesting. We do we don't do anything to accommodate those needs. Oh. It's, like, it's the same app. It's the same app. Uh -huh. It's the same app. The idea is that you can learn for free and uh -huh. it's fun and it works. That's the idea, and that that works really well for both types of users. Uh -huh. uh, but you're completely right. Can you tell us more about how Duolingo teach Chinese or Cantonese? You know, we spent a lot of effort on teaching Chinese and Cantonese. I don't know this for a fact, but I assume we're probably the largest place where people learn Chinese in the world. Um, wow. For most every language, we're the largest yeah, of provider course. <laughs> for anything, and we're happy to have Cantonese for ch for Mandarin speakers. So Mandarin speakers can learn Cantonese. So here, if you're you know in, uh, yeah. in mainland China, I did that. Uh, yeah, yeah, so good. I learned Cantonese with the first like sh uh, shrimp dumpling, shrimp dumpling. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. <laughs> All the food. We, we try to do that for most courses. We try uh -huh. to make it so that we do uh, things that are culturally relevant. Uh, so if you're I learning see. German, we probably are not teaching you about shrimp dumplings. Uh, We're probably teaching beer. you about beer, yeah, <laughs> beer and sausages and cheese. 二零一一年十一月，多邻国发布了测试版，可以说是瞬间走红。正式版还没发布，后补名单就已经有了三十万用户。Within a year, we were the top language learning. Thing in the United States. I think the the first time that I thought we really were going to succeed was in the year 2014 when Apple made Duolingo iPhone app of the year. That was the first time I thought, okay, we'll probably succeed. So when you launch it, did you do a lot of marketing, or you just like launch it and people? No marketing. It just people. It, it was all word of mouth. That's how we grew for the oh, first really? several years. It was all word of mouth, and even today. We we do some marketing today, but the majority of our growth today is still word of mouth. Oh, that that's it's because cool. people like the product and they tell their friends. Then, did you get a, another round of funding, or did you hire employees? We got a lot of rounds of funding in the、uh, funding in the U.S. We started、oh. in 2012. We got three million dollars. Then in 2013, we got 15 million dollars.、Oh, cool. Then in 
2014, again, I think we had another $40 million. Wow. Uh, in total, uh -huh. the funding that we got was $180 million. Uh, and it keeps. And just it, like you became a unicorn. Yes. yes. <clears throat> I don't remember which year we became a unicorn, maybe 2016. Uh -huh. You just something. remember that? Okay. But I don't remember the exact date, no. Yeah. So, was money, was it a big thing for you? or? No, it never was. Um, it's not like I don't like money, but it, uh -huh. this was not my major motivator. Uh -huh. um, and by the time I started Duolingo, um, because I had sold the company to Google, I had more money than I ever needed. Um, uh. So the idea with Duolingo was more of a passion project. It has turned out to be very profitable for everybody, but it was more of a passion project. You see, ah, this is Luis. He made a free learning app for free. It was very successful. But as a company, you need to consider the natural question of how to change the app, right? You see, many online companies, for example, Shopee, for example, Alipay, 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 It was still like a free app, right? Yes. Then how did you monetize? Did you figure out the business model? We figured out the business model in 2017. We knew we needed to start making some money, but we didn't know how. And, uh -huh. and we were very concerned because we wanted it to continue being free. Fortunately, we found this model that works really well, this freemium model. The idea is that you can use Duolingo entirely for free. You uh -huh. don't ever have to pay us. But if you don't pay us, you have to see an ad at the end of a lesson. So you see ads. at the end of the lesson. Yeah, at the end okay. of the lesson, you see an ad. Yeah. So we make money from ads. We don't make a lot of money from ads. We make a uh -huh. little bit of money from ads. Uh -huh. Then if you want to turn off the ads and get a few extra uh -huh. features, you can pay us to subscribe. You can sign up for the premium. Basically. For the premium version. Yes. Um, How much was that? It depends on the country. In, uh -huh. in the United States, it's about eight dollars per month. So that's the idea. And that has worked out really well about Seven to eight percent of our monthly active users pay us to subscribe, have the premium oh, really? version. Oh. The other 92, 93 percent use it for free. For, uh -huh. But the people who pay us to subscribe, uh -huh. the premium version, give us about 80 percent of our revenue. So the majority of our revenue comes from a small the, number of people that uh, pay to subscribe. Gotcha. And the other 20 comes from um, the ads. ads mostly. Well, yeah. ads and this other project, which we should talk about, which is the uh -huh. Duolingo English test. 10% comes from the Duolingo English test, 10% comes from ads, and about 80% comes from subscription. So, in this way, Duolingo has been able to solve the two different things that are very different from the two different things that are very different from the two different things that are very different from the two different things that are very different from the two different things that are very different the two different things that are very different from the two different things that are very from the two different things that are very different from the TOEFL still like, do they have online tests or? They, they do, but the majority of the test is still offline because they yeah. prefer people going to the testing center uh, because they I make see. more money from that. And you may think, well, it's not just a online test, how can it be interesting? Hey, I tell you, this is dependent on your vantage point. For the consumer or the people who are attending the test, it's really not much. It's just a few choices. But as a creative creator, as a test organizer, have you thought that you now want to do a test to challenge the TOEFL or YASU standards? How difficult is it? 即使像多邻国有钱有流量，但要想搞定这种考试啊，你想想，你要是没有点权威性，没有点门路，你说你怎么弄？我为什么这么说呢？因为我曾经真的是非常认真的考虑过要搞这么一种考试的想法，但是呢，就是因为难度确实太大，所以我就放弃了啊。这个有有机会咱们之后再说。所以你就可想而知这个考试的难度了。那鲁伊斯他是怎么做到的呢 ？When you launch an English test, you have to solve a few problems. The first one is you have to make a test. We made uh -huh. a test. It was a good test. <laughs> the second one is you have to stop cheating. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. The way we stop cheating is we turn on the front facing camera of the device and uh -huh. we have a human watch you take the test. It turns out oh. this prevents cheating. You can is it like pe are people watching you taking the test or uh, AI? It's afterwards. Uh, uh, we record a video while uh -huh. you're taking the test uh -huh. and afterwards they watch you while you're, they, they, they watch the whole video of you taking the test. And then the third thing that you have to do if you start your own test is you have to get institutions to accept your results. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And that has taken many years. But at this point, uh, we have about 5,000 uh, university programs accept the results of the Duolingo 5, English. 5,000? Yeah. Almost any university that you've ever heard of accepts uh -huh. the results of the Duolingo English test. So Stanford and Yale and Duke uh -huh. and whatever. Yeah. They all accept the Duolingo English test. Yeah. Did you approach universities we first? Approached, yeah, or you approach some other organizations? No, universities. We approach okay. universities because I used to be a professor and I knew a lot of people. Uh -huh. um, uh, that's, I see. that's what happened, yeah. At first, no university wanted to accept the results because, <laughs> because they're like, well, this is not reliable, etc. The first thing we did is we did a, a scientific study that proved that people who take the Duolingo English test versus the TOEFL, the scores are very highly correlated. 
，你看到没有？它其实就是跟传统考试托福去类比，就是说，你看我的结果跟托福结果就没什么差别呀、啊，对吧？我还在线上，我还便宜，要不你考虑考虑我？ With that, we started approaching universities with the results of the scientific study and the write up of all the security things. And we were very fortunate that one of the first universities that started accepting us was a very well known university, Yale. Oh. They said yes. I think the reason Yale said yes was、uh -huh. because for them, the English test was just like a cherry on top. The people that they accept、uh. are so good that. Most of them, anyways, already they knew that they already speak spoke English,、uh, so it's just like a, a little extra thing. But the、gotcha. fact that Yale accepted it made it so that every other university thought, "Oh, Yale accepts it." Then, and yeah, so they started. You know, other universities started accepting. Yeah, I guess the first one must be the most difficult one, right? The first one was the most difficult one, but we were very fortunate that it was such a highly ranked university that、sure. started accepting it. Yeah, and then by the time we had about eight hundred universities accepting、uh -huh. it, um, COVID came. Ah,、uh, and when COVID came. All the testing centers for the other tests closed. That's a good news for you guys, I、yes. guess. <laughs> and then all these other universities that didn't accept our test、uh -huh. thought, "Well, I can't get foreign students. You know, the TOEFL the, or the、yeah. IELTS are、uh -huh. not working." So they started accepting us. So we went within a period of three months. We went from 800 universities accepting us to 3,000 universities accepting us because、It's、they all、months. just within three months. It was a combination of COVID and the fact that we already had 800 universities three, accepting、oh, us. So、okay. people thought, "Okay, this is good enough."、Uh -huh. That that that's that that's what it was. How many employees do you have right now across the world?、Mm, uh, uh, between seven and eight hundred. Oh wow! Hey, you don't hear people saying seven or eight hundred people think the company is not big. Why? 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 一站的市值呢，大概是五十七亿，就比多邻国还少一点。但你知道 B 站有多少人吗？有一万一千多人。当然啊，你肯定不能这么比，也不是说 B 站的人就不值钱。<笑>我只是想说，你能看出来多邻国它这个人效是非常之高的。Right now you have the、uh, Duolingo English app, learning like all different languages.、Mm -hmm. You have English test and any other projects you're working on. Not only do we want to continue growing、uh, the impact that we have、uh -huh. in the world. But we're also starting to teach other things.、Um, so we're、uh, starting to teach.、Uh, yeah, we're、oh. starting to teach math, for example.、Uh -huh. um, so there's a math app. I don't think it's available in China yet,、uh -huh. but it will be soon. Yeah, when you talk about like pronunciation, one of the things I noticed that maybe in China or like other countries, people pay a lot of attention to like the accent. Yeah. But、uh, when I work in the U.S., I feel like like the I mean the goal of language is to communicate. So people don't care that much about your accent. To what extent do you think accent is、um, actually matters?、Uh, I, different people have different views. I have、uh -huh. very strong views. I, for me, as long as people can understand what you're saying,、uh -huh. that's all that matters. Especially if you're in the U.S., the U.S. is very open to foreign accents. If people can understand you, that's great. The problem、yeah. is when people can't understand. Yeah, exactly. Then, then you really need to figure、yeah. out. <laughs> but, but if people can understand you, I don't think there's a big. You know, I don't. I don't think there's a need to do,、um, you know, accent reduction or anything like that.、Sure. As long as people. So for me, the most important thing is can people understand you. When you talk about like、uh, recruitment, I think a lot of our audience are maybe still at school or at some point in their career. At some point, you have interviewed and managed probably hundreds of employees. When you hire someone, what are the traits you're looking for? Um. Well, the biggest one for us is that they are excellent at their craft. Whatever their craft is, if you're、sure. an engineer, you have to be excellent at engineering. Gotcha. If you are,、uh, you know, a marketing person, you have to be excellent at marketing, etc. And we we test、uh -huh. for that. But then we also test for other things. At Duolingo in particular, we try really hard to hire、um, people who are kind. Kind. Oh.、Okay. Yes. How、um, did you tell, like, from an interview or? You know, we can. You、uh -huh. can tell. It's. It's like. It's not perfect, but you、uh -huh. can tell.、Uh -huh. So I have a really good story for this. When we hired our chief financial officer, our CFO, which is a very important yeah,、uh, role, it's, it's kind of the, the, the second most important role、mm -hmm. in the company after the CEO. We were interviewing a lot of people.、Uh -huh. There was another person that we were about to hire.、Uh -huh. They had a really excellent resume. They passed all the interview. We really liked them, but what they didn't know is that part of the interview was the driver that drove them from the airport to the office was part of the interview, and they didn't know that,、oh, wow. and they were not nice to the driver. Oh. And we did not hire them. Everything, just because that. Just because of that. To But every, that person、yeah. was very nice to me. Of course. They were very nice to me. <laughs> you、They're、made the decision, right? They were super nice、right? to me. But we don't want to hire people who are not nice to somebody who may report to them or something like that. And we 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 actually turned them down. And it was a hard decision because 
we have been looking for a long time. Uh, exactly. This person had a very good resume, um, and but we Always. turned them down, and I'm very happy with that. So I think we tried really hard to to hire people who are who are kind. Did you plan plan it? Like, I mean, the driver was part of the interviewer. Or? Yeah, we don't do that for you know if you're a first year uh -huh. engineering grad or something. Yeah. We may not do that, but for very important roles like that, everything is part of the interview. Even you know the person that that greets them at the uh -huh. office, we want to know were they nice to you. Ah, so you see, you 下回就要去面试，一定要注意每一个细节，就对 everybody 都要非常好。So if you're looking back to maybe twenty years. A goal like what advice would you give the twenty-year-old Luis? Really, the majority of my job is is dealing with people. I see. And I should have gotten better at dealing with people earlier. I didn't know the very basic things about how to manage people. Um,、uh -huh. the first time I had to fire somebody, they didn't understand that they were being fired, and they came back the next day.、Uh, I, what did you say to them? Like I, I don't remember what I said to them. But <laughs> I thought I had fired them, and then <laughs> the next day they showed up at nine a.m. and I thought, "What are you doing here?" <laughs> How many、uh, people do you manage, like、uh, directly? Ten.、Uh -huh. Ten.、Um, okay, that's a good number. Fortunately, I like them all, and at least they tell me that they like me. <laughs> at least, they probably do. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, but they tell me, so I like that. <laughs> nice. Any book recommendations for entrepreneurship, or just like in general for career growth or personal growth? Um, I really like a book about management called High Output Management. High output management. Yes, it's by the guy who was for many many years the CEO of Intel,、uh -huh. um, okay. and it's very very good because it just tells you very actionable advice. It's not philosophical. It just tells you, for example, it says when doing a performance review,、uh -huh. you should meet with the person within 24 hours. It's like basically instructions, instructions what, what you should do. <laughs> yes, and with things which you just don't know. They're just、uh -huh. like, for example, another one that it says is if somebody quits, drop everything you're doing, and concentrate solely on that. Because one of the main reasons people quit is because they don't feel appreciated, and it's just like that is、wow. very, very good advice, and it's just very actionable stuff. And so,、uh, to me, that's one of the best books ever written about management, mainly because it's just it's, it's just an instruction. Yeah,、manual. gotcha. As opposed to many of the other books、uh -huh. are about like big stuff、uh, and feelings yeah, and philosophy <laughs> and whatever. This one is just just do this. Just do this. Yes. Yeah. And, I figure、uh, you're this type of guy. Like just yeah, just do, do this. I just want to know, and、yeah. uh, it works really well. 好，那这些呢，就是我们采访的全部内容了哈。不知道你感觉怎么样？有没有那种顿悟的时刻，或者对这种形式感觉怎么样？啊，什么心得呀、体会啊，都欢迎在弹幕评论分享一下。